announced it every other time before today, and uh, he'll be talk telling us about uh, some meta learning. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be telling you about uh, meta learning optimizers and learning rules. I'm going to be telling you why it's hard and how you can maybe fix it and show some applications. Uh, before I start, I'm going to be talking about work done by a lot of other people. Um, especially, I should call out Luke Metz, who is the first author on all the papers related to this. Um, I should also maybe call out Brian Chung, who I think I saw sitting in the back of the room somewhere. Um, uh, I shouldn't use pointer. Um, and also Nero, Jeremy, Daniel, and, and that's me at the end. Yeah, you were great. Yeah, that, that was who I am. <laughs> <laughs> So overall outline in this talk, I'm going to give some intu motivation for why we should care about learned optimizers. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges in, in training optimizers, uh, some of the solutions to those challenges. And I'm going to show two, two specific examples, one where we uh, meta train an optimizer targeting a specific class of problems. And it outperforms all existing techniques. And a second where we meta train a um, update rule targeting a task where we are unable to write down the loss function directly that we wish to optimize. So maybe just to provide some motivation, one perspective on the deep learning revolution is that it corresponded to a transition from using hand design features to using learned features. And as soon as the learned features started performing better than the hand design features, then people started using them everywhere. and. Um, we were able to build much more effective models. For, um, you can think of meta-learning as being analogous to this, but in the space of loss functions um, or update rules or architectures. And in almost all cases, we are still using hand design loss functions and hand design optimizers and hand design update rules. And they're often very poorly matched to the task that we want to do. So even, for instance, in the case of classification, what we usually care about is something like 0, 1 loss on a test set. And what we typically train on is like cross entropy loss on a training set. So we're like doubly mismatched even in the most basic machine learning problem, both in terms of data set and in terms of loss function. And, and so what we hope to do with meta learning is transition from these learned loss functions and learned update rules to loss functions and update rules and architectures that are um, themselves learned. Um, so I think I've already said most of this. Um, obviously, update rules are completely critical to the success of deep learning. Um, most current methods are hand design. Uh, you can think of um, most current optimizers, especially, are quite simple functions that pull in a gradient and output a parameter update. And we are going to instead learn those. Um, this is, um, however, turns out to be quite challenging for some reasons that I will go more into depth um, in, as we move along in the talk. So before we get into meta-learning, let's consider um, just doing gradient descent training of a neural network with some parameters w, which are initialized randomly. And to train for a single iteration, we take some loss function um, and take its gradient with respect to those parameters and subtract it from the parameters times some, some learning rate. We can do this over and over and over again until we have fully trained the model. And then after we've trained the model, we evaluate performance using some measure on that final model. For instance, um, like train accuracy or validation um, validation loss. In meta-learning, we are going to replace this gradient descent update with a learned function u, which has some, which itself has some parameters theta. And a single meta-training step is going to correspond, a single meta-training step is going to correspond to um, updating these parameters theta such that you do better on your final performance measure of your optimization run. And you can do this over and over and over again. And we call this 
um, outer training loop for this optimization of theta, either outer training or, or meta training. And we refer to theta as the outer parameters. And we refer to this like standard optimization problem, um, where one standard optimization problem is a single, um, provides a single update step for the outer training problem um, as the inner, inner problem. So will you always be feeding you this set of parameters? Um, the gradient and the current parameters. And um, so there's a, there's a catch all dot, dot, dot there. Um, and in fact, in practice, we're going to also feed you some set of additional statistics based upon the, the history of gradients. But you can feed in almost anything you want. And can you also experiment with having some extra state variables that new inputs and outputs and then passes to the future? Yes. Um, and the short answer is that the more internal state you give you, the less stable training becomes because you are now building a more and more complex dynamical system inside every step of your complex dynamical system. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll maybe expand on that a little bit more. Um, I should also emphasize, I strongly encourage you to interrupt me with questions as I ever go to the talk. Um, I love it when the audience uh, talks back to me. So cool. So this is, is a setup. Um, however, outer optimization turns out to be extremely hard. Uh, number one, it's very expensive in that every single outer training step is an entire inner training problem. Um, second, the outer loss evaluations are often quite noisy. Um, they depend on exactly how you initialize your inner problem and can have very high variance over inner initializations. Um, and finally, the outer loss surface is typically complex or, or chaotic. Um, and as a result, all the papers. Um, so yeah. to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by complex and chaotic here? Um, I actually am going to go into that. All right, thanks. Um, so, um, as a result of these problems, um, all the current approaches to learned optimizers um, require some extremely fragile tricks to get them to train at all, and they don't for the most part, generalized to new problems or even necessarily to the same problem um, very well, of course. So, I mean, it seems difficult to even imagine trying to backprop through one step of the outer loop. Yeah. Because then you like have to think about all the updates you ever made and try to change them and see the histories. Or, you know, so you must have some smarter way of trying to do it or proposal. Um, so, I mean, the short answer is just automatic differentiation. Um, and that's just enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so um, it, it is kind of brutal, and, and um, we're going to give some examples of why it's brutal. But, uh, so there's maybe two classes of approaches that people might use to solve this type of problem. One of them is black box optimization, um, which involves techniques like random search or reinforcement learning or evolution. Um, and if you want to think about estimation of the hyperparameters of a standard optimizer, as a meta-learning problem, then random search would be the most common technique that people currently use to, to find um, parameters of their optimizer. However, all of these techniques scale quite badly to high dimensional state spaces and thus do not work very well at training flexible parametric optimizers. The other class of techniques are those that use gradients. Gradients give you much richer training signals, and um, this is technically allowed in that the entire training process is differentiable. The final parameters of your model are just what you got by composing your um, parametric update rule u with itself many, many times. And so similar to training in RNN, you can backprop through that process and directly compute gradients <coughs> with respect to theta. Um, Typically, when people, uh, yes? Quick question, have you also fed random bits in? Random bits? Into, into you, does you also just get some pure randomness? Uh, no, but you gets more than enough randomness in terms of the, the tasks it's, it's asked for. Okay, I'll ask you yeah. later right offline. Um, so typically, when people are training um, a dynamical system, um, such as an RNN, or such as unrolled optimization, they um, make their lives easier 
by performing truncated backpropagation through time. And in truncated backpropagation through time, what you do is you take your inner optimization process and you run it for some number of steps. And then rather than going all the way to the end before computing your outer loss, you compute your outer loss um, after some fixed number of steps, in this case two. And then you backprop through those two steps. And then you initialize where you ended up at the last time and you run optimization for another two steps. And you backpropagate through those two steps. And you do this over and over and over again. Um, and this is great in that you have many more gradients for each um, run of the inner optimization. It's also great in that it turns out, and I'll show in a moment, your loss surface is better behaved. Um, but it is unfortunate in that doing this, you are, of course, computing your outer um, loss in a biased way. You're interested in the loss you get by running optimization for all steps and then computing a loss. And um, because you only backpropagate a few stop steps and then <coughs> cut the gradients, you are just dropping terms from your gradients. Um, in RNNs, those are not necessarily harmful. In optimization, the best performing hyperparameters are often um, in RNNs, this is, uh, sorry, in optimizers, this is often far more harmful. Um, so there are perhaps two conflicting goals. One is we'd love to just do one long unrolled optimization, which will give us a much less biased um, estimate, um, but is unfortunate in that each iteration then of the outer training loop is quite slow and is also unfortunate in that the loss surface turns out to be more horrible. The other approach is that you do many, many short um, unroll steps, in which case it's fast to train and the loss surface is smooth, but you end up with very biased gradients. And so diving in a little bit more to those, those challenges, which I've like heavily alluded to, let's first start by looking at the problem of bias induced by short unrolls in, in, um, in meta learning. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask whether there's a role for things like hypernetworks here. Um, so hypernetworks, I think, could provide a, that would be a great research project. Like you could, for instance, design a hypernetwork so that optimization in the latent space of the hypernetwork is, is better than optimization in in the parameters of the network you're directly training, um, but it's separate from, from anything I've talked about. Mm -hmm. So there's a new and hackier version where, as opposed to here, where you were just doing propagating values in the forward pass, but only truncating in the backward pass, yeah. you could completely just split the sequences into this thing and do both forward and backward in the same manner. Essentially, the state won't even be fed one so, so, so actually, in some ways, that's better in that you have an unbiased gradient. Um, but it's worse in that you only ever run optimization if you're like truncate up three steps. You only ever run optimization for three steps. So you only get to see problems that you can um, get to by running like three training steps. Um, cool. So here we're looking at a, at a nice toy system. Um, and what we're doing is we are training a two-layer MLP. Um, on MNIST um, using Atom. And we're running training for, for 10,000 steps. And then we are trying to optimize the learning rate that we use in Atom in order to um, train on this problem as quickly as possible. And just via grid search, this dashed line here corresponds to the optimal learning rate. And so what you find is that when you backpropagate through all 10,000 training steps, then, of course, you're descending the right loss surface. And you do gradient descent in terms of log learning rate, and you get to the right log learning rate. Um, as you reduce the number of the length of the unrolls that you backprop through, then you converge to suboptimal learning rates. Um, and in fact, even doing 100 unrolls, you actually move in the wrong direction after initializing your learning rate. 
and we'll end up with a learning rate for Adam that's worse than the one that you started with. Um, so, bias, as, yes? How sensitive, is this to that? How sensitive is that just to an arbitrary initial learning rate? Because if you picked a different one, wouldn't you move in the right direction? Yeah, so if you, if you, the final learning rates that you converge to are a function of the enroll length, not the initial learning rate that you started with. So, so you can, um, find yourself at significantly suboptimal learning rates, um, even if you do a surprisingly large number of unrolls. So here, for instance, we're like doing backpropagating through 100 steps of optimization, which, which naively you might think is enough to get a good sense of the gradient. Um, and actually, even for doing something as simple as estimating the optimal learning rate, you end up with an optimal learning rate, which is quite far from, from what you would want it to be. Mm -hmm. The number of steps in the inner optimization problem has to be fixed a priori. It cannot be decided adaptively because then it won't be differentiated. Yeah, yeah, that, that um, you would have to, there are perhaps ways to differentiate through a discrete decision like that, but it would add a great deal of additional complexity. Um, cool. Maybe, maybe the more exciting and also um, more pathological problem that you run into is that um, you find that the gradients with respect to the optimizer parameters theta often diverge, um, or alternatively, that your outer loss surface is chaotic. Um, and maybe this is best illustrated to start with in a toy 1D system. So here we have a one-dimensional loss surface, and we're trying to do gradient descent on this loss surface. And we're doing this with SGD plus momentum. And if you have a small value of the momentum parameter, then you will descend into this first well. If you have a large value of this momentum parameter, then you will make it over this hump and you will descend into this second well. Um, and so here I'm plotting as a function of inner problem training step what your inner parameter value is. And here I'm plotting log of one minus momentum. And for a small value of momentum, you end up right here in this first well. For a large value of the momentum, you end up here in this second well. And as you increase the momentum even more, you begin to oscillate between the two wells before finally settling into one or the other. So each of these y coordinates corresponds to a different loss value here. So, for instance, um, this, um, th this y coordinate equals 0 corresponds to a loss of 5. y coordinate equals whatever that value is, about 3, corresponds to a loss of 0. And right between the two, you have a ridge with a loss of, of 11. So what we can do is we can plot the loss that you end up with after um, a given number of training steps as a function of the momentum, of the parameter of your optimizer. <clears throat> and so what you see is if you only train for a small number of steps, like 10 steps, then this function is relatively smooth. Um, but we are iterating a dynamical system over and over and over and over again. And dynamical systems like this are, are prone both to um, um, collapse to fixed points and to have like discontinuous transitions between which fixed point they, they collapse to. And as you increase the number of training steps, then you find that your loss surface in terms of this one minus momentum parameter starts to develop discontinuities. And so you might imagine the problem of meta-training an optimizer, um, where you unroll the optimizer for 100 training steps as the problem of doing gradient descent on this purple surface. And as you can see, this purple surface both has like rapid, extremely high frequency fluctuations in its um, loss value. Um, and additionally, gradients will not be very useful because they're going to be very, either very close to zero or very close to infinity. 
Um, so what about neural networks? All the examples I've shown so far are, are for toy, toy systems. Does something similar happen when you attempt to um, meta train um, a, when you attempt to train a neural network um, or meta train an optimizer for a neural network? So here we have a two dimensional slice through the weight space of a three layer MLP that we're training an MNIST using Atom. And here you can see we have a very narrow range of, that should say log learning rate. We have a very narrow range of log learning rates. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the trajectory that you trace out in the parameter space of this three layer MLP as a function of the log learning rate over this very narrow range. And initially, you perform a few iterations, and all the, all the learning rates trace out nearly identical trajectories. Um, and then after around 10 iterations of training, they begin to split. And 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Um, and what you see is that these tiny changes in initial learning rate lead to dramatic bifurcations in the path you take when um, optimizing a three-layer neural network. Um, and additionally, every single one of these final locations is going to have a slightly different loss value. So if you were to look at the loss value as you adjust this learning rate, you would find that it is extremely rough and nearly discontinuous. Um, and in fact, um, this is maybe my favorite training visualization. For what? Training loss or generalization? Um, so, so far, everything we've looked at has been, has been training loss. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure we're still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still, we're still in training loss land. Um, so perhaps my favorite visualization of this talk, um, what we can do is we can try to see this more visually. So here, we actually have a three-layer MLP that we're training. And we're going to train this three-layer MLP with a parametric optimizer. Um, and what we're showing here is a two-dimensional slice through the par parameter space of this learned optimizer. And we're gonna, I'm going to tell you about the architecture of this learned op optimizer in a minute. Um, and what we see is that if you only do one enroll, then um, the loss landscape, the outer loss landscape, is quite smooth. And it would probably be quite, quite straightforward to do gradient descent on this, on this landscape. You want to go from the larger or whiter values to the darker or blacker values, uh, to the lower or darker values. Um, as we increase the number of unroll steps we do before evaluating the outer loss, you begin to see more and more complex structure um, entering into the loss landscape until by the time you've done um, 50 unroll step, 50 unrolls, um, basically every single pixel has a different loss value. And doing optimization on this loss surface is, of course, quite challenging, um, either, either via gradient descent or even via random search methods, um, because the loss value in many regions of parameter space changes so rapidly and so discontinuously. Yeah. It seems like in these examples, the local structure of the loss surface is bad. Yeah. But the global isn't so terrible. That is a beautiful observation, which, which perhaps directly moves into the next part of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> How many total parameters are there? Um, there's about 2,000 outer parameters, so 2,000 parameters in the optimizer. And I would have to think for the neural network, but it's probably like order 100k or something. Um, cool. So hopefully I've now convinced you that there are like two classes of pathologies if you try to meta train an optimizer. One of those classes of pathologies is that um, it's very easy to get biased gradients, and those biased gradients can take you to qualitatively poor solutions. Um, the other class of pathologies is that your loss landscape, um, which comes from iterating this like dynamical system, um, 
can be chaotic and can have a lot of extremely high frequency structure in your disk continuities. So now that I've introduced those problems, I'm going to propose um, one, one class of solutions to those problems. Um, specifically, I'm going to say that we can do fix this to a remarkable degree using variational optimization. So what you can do is if L of theta is your original outer loss surface, you can define some distribution over perturbations to your parameters, and you can convolve L of theta with that distribution. So for instance, here what we're doing is we're taking the parameters theta and we're perturbing them um, in a Gaussian distribution around theta, and then we're averaging the original loss over that um, distribution of perturbations. And so what this does is it effectively smooths your loss landscape um, and suppresses the high frequency structure. Um, and as Boris, as Boris noted, um, often we find that the global or at least larger scale structure of these loss landscapes remains relatively, relatively well behaved, even as the local structure becomes like pathologically poor. So once we, does this make sense to everyone? Cool. So once we've written down this variational loss, we can write down two different unbiased gradient estimators for, for this loss. Uh, one of those gradient estimators uses the um, score function trick or the like reinforced style, style estimator where we write this in terms of the gradient of the log normal distribution. Um, this is the same strategy used in evolutionary strategies. Um, the other unbiased estimator we can write for this um, gradient is by using the reparameterization trick where we write theta tilde as theta plus um, a frozen offset drawn from a normal distribution and backpropagate the entire system. And so both of these will, um, in expectation, estimate the same gradient of this smooth loss function, but they will have extraordinarily different variance properties. So especially, um, if the loss surface is smooth and well-behaved, then the reparameterization style gradient will have much, much, much lower variance. Um, and I think this is what people's intuition generally is, is that the like, reparameterization trick style gradients are much better estimators. Um, on the other hand, if the loss surface has high curvature or a lot of stochasticity, then the ES style gradient estimator is going to be far better. And maybe just as a simple um, toy illustration of this, if you have a loss surface that goes like this, then the ES style estimator is effectively taking a finite difference of widely separated points and it's going to give you a low variance gradient estimator while the um, reparameterization trick is sampling a bunch of points, computing the gradient at each of those points, and then averaging the gradient. And so if the gradients have a lot of high frequency noise, it's going to give you a very high frequency estimator. Um, and in fact, for training a learned optimizer, whose architecture I'm going to show you in a moment, we can plot the gradient variance um, of each of these gradient estimators over the course of training. Uh -huh. Are these uh, theoretical results which like, quantify these properties? Are they theoretical results that They'll quantify these properties? Or are these like qualitative results that you see in the paper? Do you mean the different variance properties? Or? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm almost completely positive there are. We have we don't talk we don't do theoretical statements okay. about the yeah, sure. in our work. Oh, because it feels like one could write them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's pretty it's pretty I think it's pretty straightforward actually. But, um, smoothing but smoothing the yeah. function. These results that also depend um, perhaps a naive question, but um, yeah. I have no shame. Uh, um, <laughs> like, do they depend to some extent on, like, with evolution strategies, you're sort of setting like a radius in which you're. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. The radius seems like that would influence. Yeah, yeah. And actually, actually, for both of these, we're choosing this radius, right? These, these, these both have like noise drawn from the same, same perturbation. Yeah, this is, this is the hyperparameter of the system, and, and you just need to set it to something. Or a hyper, hyper. Um, yeah, I guess it's a hyper, hyper parameter. 
um, which we did relatively little hyper hyper searching over. Um, but but if you were to do this properly, you would you would do yeah, a, uh, like a great search over that. I guess uh, like yeah. the sort of reason why I ask is is that in terms of those findings about like the variance. Um, I mean, I'm just asking it based on like the sort of visual intuition from the plot you get. Ah, like, yeah, okay. So qualitatively, like that, what'll happen? Yeah, could that be explaining the difference in the result? Or something? Like if you just switch the radius, the radii of the different approaches, does that? Yeah. Like okay. Different? So qual qualitatively, what I imagine would happen is the reparameterization gradient is going to have a variance, which is roughly constant, even as you change um, your your perturbations, because the reparameterization gradient, um, its variance just comes from the variance in the analytic gradient of the function. Whereas I would expect, um, whereas the evolutionary strategies gradient has variance from two different sources. One of those sources is like shot noise or like sampling noise, and that's going to be constant. And then the other source is um, the like spatial scale over which you're averaging when you, yeah. when you average. And that, so like one of those two no noise terms for ES is going to drop as you increase that radius. Um, and so as you make it larger, I would expect that this term remains roughly the same variance, and this term like drops down to like some asymptotic constant. Thanks. Um, but we did, in fact, measure this empirically. And what you find is that, at least for this particular task, early in meta-training, um, where you're still in a smooth region of the outer loss landscape, that um, the reparameterization style gradients is roughly five orders of magnitude better than the ES gradients, so in terms of variance. So it's greatly beneficial to use the gradients uh, when you are in a smooth region in the lost landscape. On the other hand, um, later in outer training, you find that the reparameterization gradient um, ends up being up to like 20 or 25 orders of magnitude worse in variance than the ES gradient. And so you might imagine why like previous work that tries to train their learned optimizer using this has to jump through a lot of hoops in order to get learning to, to function in, in a stable fashion. Um, and just maybe like a, a neat qualitative observation, um, in terms of optimization, the best performing optimization hyperparameters are almost always on the edge of the stable regime. So even if you're just like training a quadratic, um, your best learning rate for like an ill-conducing quadratic is the largest learning rate before you diverge along the highest curvature direction. And so this is kind of the source for why you get this um, extreme instability, especially later in training. It's because um, the learned optimizer, the best parameters of the learned optimizer are right on the edge of the parameters of the learned optimizer where everything blows up. Uh -huh. That sounds like an argument for decreasing the radius. Of? Uh, like when you're doing the reparameterization training. Um, like during the course of that. Oh, you mean like annealing the radius? Yeah. Um, right. like because the, the blue line is the limit, is that radius is zero? Yeah. The, no, 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 no. The blue line. I'm sorry, I'm confused. About it. The, the blue, so this entire plot is for a fixed radius, so it's a fixed. No, I uh, realize that. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, and. Okay, okay, cool. Okay. So at the end, are you factoring out the variance that's being added to the gradients because of variance across mini patches? As an I, when, so let's say you're measuring the. the no, mini this is this is the full the full variance. So there's there's mini batch variance in here as well. It's just that the mini batch batch variance is like swamped by your by your your um, the variance of your gradient estimator. Um, actually, I'm not sure if that's true for the ES case. It may, I, I'm actually not sure what the relative contribution is. But, but this includes many batch variants. Okay. Gotcha. Given that plot, is there any role for starting with RP before you get later on in your? Yeah, I mean, this, this definitely um, suggests that you might want to. One strategy might be to start with one, and then when it goes unstable, switch to the other. Um, we actually did something which is um, maybe slightly more principal, but also slightly more expensive, which is we just always computed both. Um, and you can reuse the same, the same um, points for both estimators. So you can evaluate the functions at the same points you evaluate the gradients and like, use it for both estimators. And um, especially what you can do is you can use inverse variance weighting to come up with an um, optimal variance combination, um, at least if you imagine that the variance is like independent 
between the two estimators um, and just take a weighted sum of the two unbiased gradient estimators. Uh, maybe a nice property of doing this is that the worst case variance of G merged is the minimum of the variance of either of the, the two estimators. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, 10 minutes left? Oh, awesome. Okay, so um, great. Uh, so just talked about a method to deal with the chaotic loss surface. Uh, we do something much simpler to deal with the bias from truncations which is um, unrolling the entire sequence is still quite expensive, so we just anneal this. We start out by unrolling many short segments, and then over the course of meta-training, we increase the length of the unrolls until at the very end of meta-training, we are unrolling over the full 10,000 training steps. Um, and we are going to demonstrate the utility of this by using it to train um, some optimizers, especially an optimizer targeted at a specific set of tasks. Um, I'm not going to go super into the details of the architecture that we use for the optimizer. I'm just going to tell you that it is a per weight MLP. So you have a little copy of this exact same MLP with the exact same parameters for every weight in your network. This MLP is going to take as input a number of features that we know are useful for existing optimizers, like the gradient and um, the gradient average over various time scales. And it's going to produce its output and update to the parameters, um, in fact, decomposed as a log learning rate and a, a um, update direction. We are going to apply this um, optimizer to the task of training on ImageNet. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit in depth into how we divide up train and test because people always get a little bit confused about this for, for meta training. Um, so what we're going to do here is we are going to um, divide all the ImageNet classes into an outer train set of classes and then an outer test set of classes that are never seen during outer training. And then within each one of these classes, our data is divided up into an inner train set, and then an inner validation and an inner test set. Um, we're going to target 10-way uh, classification problems, um, and we're going to target training a three-layer convolutional neural network. And we're choosing a very specific task and a very specific set of data sets, such that we don't have to worry about, like, defining the distribution of a task that the optimizer is supposed to work well on. Um, maybe one really cool aspect about this is traditionally optimizers target the training loss. Um, in reality, what we care about is not training loss. We care about generalization loss. Um, and so we could imagine using two different losses for our meta training. One of those is the training loss, and the other is the validation loss on the inner problem. Um, this is kind of cool because it means that by meta training, you can directly target generalization. You can directly target an optimizer, which is going to do well on a validation set. Um, I don't think I need to go through this again. Um, so, the entire problem we're solving is we want to find the weights of some parametric optimizer, and we're going to do this with like variational optimization and truncated back prop. Um, we're going to take an expectation over tasks that we want the optimizer to solve. And then we are going to, for each of those tasks, evaluate our outer objective, which is either going to be training loss at the end of training or validation loss at the end of training. And then for each of those outer objectives, we are going to um, apply the learned optimizer to training a small three-layer content on a subset of image classes. The results are, are as shown here. Um, first of all, we can look at the case where we meta train targeting train loss. And in that case, um, we find that the learned optimizer is able to optimize training loss far faster than any other of the optimizers. 
Um, I would, by the way, specifically like to call out our controls here. Um, so the purple and green controls are Atom with L2 regulariza regularization, L1 regularization, um, and um, learning rate decay, where the number of hyperparameters we have is eight. We have all the Atom hyperparameters, we have the two learning rate decay coefficients, and we have um, um, the two regularization coefficients, and we try and we um, evaluated over a thousand training instances for each of it. So this is our, these are very well hyperparameter optimized atom. Um, and so you, what you find is that when you target a training loss, we do much better than existing optimizers, even when they're well hyperparameter optimized. But interestingly, when we then evaluate the same optimizer in the test loss, it diverges. So in fact, fitting as rapidly as possible to the training loss is like horribly bad on the test loss. On the other hand, if we train a learned optimizer um, targeting the validation loss rather than the training loss, then we find that on training loss, it does worse than any of the other optimizers. It's the orange line. But on test loss, it does um, um, better than any of the other optimizers. So yes? So this, this is a classification task? This is a classification task. And this is like hold out, hold out uh, classes. So it's possible that test loss diverges, but you're still you're doing better in the classifications, right? Because if your norm goes to infinity, yeah, we 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 did that. We did not measure that, or, or if we did, I don't know what the answer is. Um, but that is that is possible. Um, I'd also, by the way, like to emphasize that this is wall clock time and not and not iterations. Um, so so this is also um, despite the additional overhead that we're paying with the. Uh, Learned, learned optimizer. Um, and um, three minutes. All right. I'm going to skip this. We, we looked at how well it generalized to new ta tasks. The answer is it sort of does. Um, I want to really quickly introduce one other um, project I think is super neat, um, which is you can also use meta learning to um, optimize a task where you're unable to write down the loss at training time. Maybe the canonical example of this is unsupervised representation learning, where your goal is to expose some high-level attributes of the data, like object identity, without labels. You want to get all of ImageNet and come up with like, like object ID without knowing the labels. Um, and this is really challenging because we need to write down a learning rule or a loss function that optimizes for something that we don't know at training time. Um, current approaches to this involve just like hand designing a surrogate loss, like log likelihood or a VAE or a GAN or something and hoping that a useful representation arises as a side effect. And I can show you some plots later if you're curious, um, illustrating that there's like a massive objective function mismatch in that case. Um, however, there are many tasks for which we do know what the eventual desired high level attributes that we want are. So for instance, we know that if we do unsupervised training on ImageNet, we really want the model to learn a high level representation which captures um, like object class. And so the proposed approach is that we're going to meta-learn an unsupervised update rule that um, trains models to have a representation, which is um, a really good representation for supervised tasks, where we know what the answer that we want it to get is. And then we're going to apply that um, meta-learned unsupervised update rule to totally new tasks. Um, and I'm going to skip the details, because I think I have like 90 seconds. Um, and I am just going to say, first of all, it works. Um, and maybe a little bit interesting is that we can meta train on a distribution of tasks, um, uh, distribution of data sets, and we can generalize to new data sets, and we outperform like a vanilla VAE, which is nice. Um, most exciting for me is our hope here is that we can meta learn an unsupervised learning rule, which generalizes um, to any data set or any data modality or any task. And so we meta-trained on a whole bunch of image tasks. And we can measure transfer to a totally different task, in this case, to um, sentiment classification in IMDb movie reviews. And we find that over the course of meta-training, um, we actually learn a learning rule that does significantly better on this text task. So it's like, totally different domain task. Although later in meta training, the learning rule begins to overfit to the, to the image domain 
and does, does worse on the text task. Um, I think I'm like so over time, so I'm just gonna go to the last slide and then maybe there'll be time for questions. Um, so, summary of the entire talk. Um, both bias and chaos cause problems in meta-training. Um, we have a proposal for how to fix this by using a variational loss. Um, we demonstrate that it works by training a task-specific learned optimizer. Um, I additionally think that uh, meta-learning is particularly nice in that it allows you to target tasks where you can't write down the objective that you care about, but you can write down a meta-objective you care about, where unsupervised representation learning is one example of this. Um, and we additionally show that we can train a learned update rule on, on representation learning. Okay. So since we're a little over time, let's just take one question while Carolina sets up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll talk to you offline about the unsupervised loop, but since uh, it's the only question, I'm going to be a little bit more pointed. Um, so it seems like you have, like, between the inner loop and outer loop, you wind up going from, like, neural network training is already expensive, and you sort of go from something like end to end squared. Yeah. And I guess what I'm, like, like, I, granted, I know it's early in the basic research stage, but I'm just curious, like, has there yet been a payoff to justify it? Like, is there a single task where um, the upshot has been, and apologies if you already said this, I'm probably missed it, where, like, meta-learning truly outperforms anything else that we have to justify, like, the massive computation? Um, so there has definitely been a payoff in terms of architecture design. So though I didn't discuss it in this, in this talk, um, there has been a lot of work on... Um, like neural architecture search or architecture design, and there it has definitely paid off. Um, I think in terms of optimizers, we're right on the edge. So I think here we demonstrated, like if what you care about is training a three-layer ConfNet on, on an image data set, then I can hand you an optimizer right now that will outperform on, in wall clock time any existing optimizer, but um, that hasn't been generalized to a larger set of tasks yet, and no one has scaled that up to like a production scale uh, task. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.